everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear Sarah? <coughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Marvellous. Well. <laughs> what? <laughs> what a silly me. We're going to start then. Thanks very much, guys, for coming. Um, I'm going to start a minute early, so hopefully we have a minute of extra exciting content to get through in this session. Um, we're going to finish uh, promptly uh, at half past to enable you to go and get first in the lunch queue or whatever you want to go and do next. Um, but all of us are going to be around afterwards for questions uh, as well. So um, the first thing for me to do as your uh, chair for this panel session on building a successful online video strategy is say hello and welcome you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, today is a day packed with sessions to do with much less to do with the technology, but much more to do with the strategy and how you use online video to achieve business objectives. That is what really interests all four of us up here on this stage. And I'm going to introduce the panel to you in a second. Um, you're going to hear very little from me, um, which those of you who know me will be very relieved to hear. Um, I'm merely here to introduce these three experts to you. Uh, before I do that, I will just do my one slide that I have. So I'm really, I'm really hoping that this first slide is the successful beginning of this very exciting way of using an iPhone to control a keynote. Look at this. Woo! Um, you know you're in a technology conference when you have to do stuff like this. Uh, so very briefly, um, I'm Steph at Perone. I'm here because um, I'm an independent, um, allegedly, in the world of um, online video. It's my job to go around to brands and organizations as a sort of freelance gun for hire and help them to come up with and then to deploy their online video strategies. Inevitably, this has got me involved in a few other projects. So I'm actually here at this session uh, or this exhibition here with Buto, who are an online video platform I've been working with um, for the last 18 months as a really exciting UK-based um, piece of technology. Um, but I also work directly with brands like RBS and Tesco on their video strategy. Um, and I've met some of you here through the uh, online video strategies training course that I run for eConsultancy, um, who are, uh, if you don't know, a really, really brilliant um, uh, digital marketing training organization in which I have no shares. So when I say they're brilliant, it's completely down to personal recommendation and not commercial interest. Um, all three of our panelists do have commercial interest. They all run businesses, um, successful businesses in this area of producing online video, and particularly the bit that isn't to do so much with just the creative or, or just the idea, but is to do with the strategy. So, so these three people are here because their businesses go into clients and help them work on the content, um, on the strategy, and maybe on the technology too. So we've got a really good, solid triangle of, of, of expertise um, from, from all three of them. And I'm going to introduce them briefly to you now. Uh, Simon to my right, you can wave. Uh, Simon Cross, who is the creative director of ST16, um, a massive award-winning video company um, in the UK uh, that I've known for a little while. Um, Simon, do you want to tell us in 15 seconds what your business does? Uh, yes, I will. Um, we uh, are viral film specialists. Uh, you caught me unawares there. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've been training for 10 years, but in the last four years we've specialised in viral and we've had some huge successes, not just with numbers, but with other measurable results, which I'll talk to you about shortly. Fantastic. Um, to his right is Sarah Platt, uh, who's one of the founders of Kinura. Um, Sarah and I had a, a really exciting conversation when we heard we're going to be on this panel together um, that I, I really, really enjoyed, just sort of um, thrashing the hell out of all the bad practice that's going on out there in the world of online video. Um, but I'll leave it to you to be put on the spot now to give us a 15 second pitch of what you do. Okay, um, so my company, Kinora, uh, does live webcasting, online presentations or webinars as they're known these days, um, content creation, services to do with that so um, but yeah I've been in this game for longer than I would like to remember I've been to streaming media Europe I think every year since it began um, so you know obviously there's, there's a, a plethora of <coughs> ways of doing things ways of looking at things all the new developments with technology um, I think our focus is really about looking at what people want to do and how they can best do it uh, and being nice whilst we're Aside from it being nice, that's kind of <laughs> what strategy is in a nutshell for me. It's just having a really clear aim for what you're trying to achieve mm. and making sure that everything that you do in your online video um, reflects, supports, and helps you deliver on that aim. 
this whole sort of strategy idea, um, which you've got an extended day of conference sessions about, is really a very simple idea, um, but it's unbelievably hard to execute. And so when we say strategy, I think that's what we mean. We're just talking about having clear aims and making sure everything we do tries to aim and help support those aims. Um, we'll come back to this later in a second. Um, my final and third panelist uh, is Thomas Oedenko from Video Agency, who are based, as he's gonna tell you shortly, in France. Um, uh, the first conversation I had with Thomas was about this triangle, this kind of idea of the value that a, that a, a company or a, a provider in this space can offer, being not just about the technology or just about the creativity, but also about the strategy and how that's so often missing from the projects that people get involved with. So Thomas, do you want to very briefly say to us what you do? Yeah, so thanks. So yes, we, we help brands uh, construct uh, media, become media, and uh, with video, which is a, a big part, and uh, we try to define long-term uh, content strategy for them, and we've got an overlook of the market and what's uh, going on in YouTube and who succeed to help them going and become a media. We're going to look at some examples from YouTube um, throughout the session. We've got quite a lot of video media examples to show you, which I hope will all work smoothly now that we've got off to a good start. Um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to give my panelists um, uh, seven minutes each to talk through some case studies. And what I've asked them to do is present, and obviously in the course of presenting case studies, show us some of the content. But I said what we're particularly interested in this audience in is the strategy. So why are these examples of good strategy? What was the aim when it was started? Um, what was the effect of this content or this project or this plan? And what was the actual way in which that was measured? So um, that's been the sort of the, the, the thing that I've asked them to think about when they're choosing their case studies. I've also asked them each to come up with a few kind of unique angles on this, um, this market because I think we're in a, an ever-changing world of digital media. Um, these guys are much better positioned than me um, and hopefully in a useful position from your point of view to be able to say what's important, what's about to happen, what are the trends or things or, 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 or considerations that we should be making that are most important. So each of them is going to do that for seven, possibly eight or nine minutes each. Um, and then we're going to open up to the floor for Q&A. Um, and I, I really hope that you'll use this opportunity when we've had the presentations to, uh, to ask good questions. And by good questions, I mean really tricky, nasty questions for our panel. Um, so I hope that's okay for everyone. I hope you get some value out of this in the next uh, 40 minutes. Can I just very briefly ask, before we kick off, who here is from a brand that is doing or about to do content? And who here is from somebody who makes content for a living for brands or for other people? I know you are, John. So where are the rest of you from? Technologies. Yeah? Social networks. Yeah? We've got about a balance. Further people who don't want to answer the question slash are from interesting businesses that have fallen outside of my Venn diagram. Some people who are from... Um, brands that are, that are doing strategy and producing content, some people who are making content for a living or, or as part of those, those projects, those campaigns. That's great. We've got a really good, really good uh, cross-section of people. Um, that's helpful. Thank you. Please feel free to ask questions later on. Um, I may have intimidated all three of my panelists and put them on the spot already, um, but that's my job. Your job is to ask difficult questions, and I shall help you to do that. So don't, don't be afraid to ask questions later on. Um, and we're going to go straight in to Simon to tell us about slide just to tell you who we are, um, to put my presentation into context and then hopefully answer some questions that people want me to say. Um, uh, ST16 has been training for 10 years. Uh, in those 10 years we've worked all over the world for, for lots of different types of brands, uh, working across lots of different types of sectors and we've produced films for lots of different media from cinema TV uh, through to uh, viral and journal comms, that kind of thing. In the last four years we've specialised in viral and that really happened because we produced our first viral that was a huge success, produced another that was a huge success, and we thought we must be doing something right. Uh, and we've been, in the last four years, we've produced a number of other successful films. And you can see there the, uh, the, the awards that we've won. Um, we've also got a number of tangible results, which I'm going to talk to you about today. It's not just about the numbers like it was four or five years ago. There's so much more now that we would expect to get out of a successful viral film. Um, uh, I need a flag every minute. I've got seven minutes. Well, okay, I'll flag right. you every minute. 
So I'm going to kick off with Crash Proof. Has anyone seen Crash Proof, this film? No, I usually get one. one, one. I usually get one, that's too soon. Um, so um, to give you a, a, a quick background, um, the client, who was Kenneth Valley Police, approached us and said, uh, we want a viral film. But they were pretty enlightened, and they said, well, the trouble is we've got a, quite a regional audience. Um, so can we reach a regional audience with a viral film? You know, we don't want sort of a million 12-year-olds in Japan watching this. We want 35 to 55-year-old men in the Thames Valley region watching this film and talking about it. So we went off um, and worked on a strategy that would make that work. And it was hugely successful. So uh, I'll talk about what we did. Um, in fact, the first thing I'm going to do is show you the film because uh, I don't want to ruin anything. So sit back and watch it. It's only about a minute long. And I'll talk to you about how we approached the film and the results we got from it. Dieser zur Unfallverhütung konzipierte Nachschriftsatz für Motorräder wurde von TFK Engineering entwickelt. Die technischen Details sind vertraulich, aber wir zeigen Ihnen die wichtigsten Eigenschaften des Prototyps. Der integrierte Computer überwacht die Radumgebung mit Hilfe von Video und Datenübertragung. Das Programm sucht fortlaufend nach Risikofaktoren wie zum Beispiel Fahrzeuge und Fußgänger und analysiert tausende von potenziellen Gefahrensituationen. Es prüft an einer Kreuzung zum Beispiel, ob ein Autofahrer sie gesehen hat. Die ermittelten Risiken werden an einen außen am Fahrradhelm angebrachten Empfänger übertragen und der Fahrer sieht auf einem im Helm integrierten Display, wo und worin die Gefahr besteht. Das Auto fährt auf die Kreuzung zu, ohne dass der Fahrer prüft, ob sich ein Motorradfahrer nähert. Das Fahrrad erkennt dies als potenzielle Gefahr und warnt seinen Fahrer rechtzeitig. Wir können die Aufnahmen aus dem Helmsystem herunterladen und Ihnen genau zeigen, was der Fahrer gesehen hat. Dann mal los, Karl. Okay, so that's the end of that. Um, could you all read the subtitles, because it's kind of crucial. Um, okay, we've got some really interesting stuff to talk about on that one. Uh, firstly, the strategy. Um, the strategy started with us, with a creative. Uh, any successful online film that goes viral has something clever or interesting about it. So um, we, we've had a number of successes before this one, so we, we use what we learned to and the research that we did around the, um, the born-again bikers, as they're, as they're known. To, uh, to develop a basic creative. We took that creative uh, and went and run focus groups to, so that we can learn more about the target audience because this target audience is quite a hard one. They don't like to be <coughs> preached to. Um, so we had to be really sensible about how we approached it. Um, and we went back to the client and said, look, here's our creative and the strategy we've got for reaching your, your regional audience is to really use this creative, which we think is going to work really well, reach as many people as we can, go for a few million views, maybe a, even a couple of hundred thousand views and then use those views to reach the, the regional um, press. So what we did is we released this film without a tagline, uh, and it, it achieved about four million views. And the really interesting thing was it was featured on almost every motorcycle forum you, you'll see around the world. It was featured in Motorcycle News, the, uh, the magazine, and everyone was talking about the key messages that client was trying to promote, which were basically, uh, it's not about the bike, it's about the rider, try and get some more training. So if you look at all the comments around this film, they're about, it's the rider's fault, why didn't you look over his shoulder? You know, it's not about the bike, it's about the, the rider, you need to make sure you know what you're doing on a bike, all those kind of things. So once we'd reached those four million views and we'd already actually achieved quite a lot of press and exposure, we uh, added a tagline to the end of the film and that actually drove uh, an increase of 1,200% um, to visit to the um, Safer Rider website. Um, so they were getting 10,000 views a, a year on their website. Once we put a tagline on the end of the film, they, got, they were getting 10,000 views a month at least. So that's a minimum amount. And the interesting thing was that they had to lay on extra training courses because demand started to outstrip the actual uh, the courses that were available. So it was hugely successful there. It also gained international PR. Motorcycle News featured it again after, they, after it was successful and saying, oh, you got us. It's a really good idea, really good way to to talk to, uh, to motorcyclists. All of the chat on the forums was positive. Clients didn't get any negative talk about it. 
It's won a number of awards. It's been nominated for another one we're going to see tonight. The inter interesting thing about this film was the fact that we came up with that strategy at the start and said to the client, you're completely right, a viral film, it's sometimes it can be hard to reach a reasonable audience, but how about we come up with an idea to do that? And they found that every time they went to any event in that region, the most cyclists that, that were coming to that event had all seen the film, and they were all talking about it, and they were all positive about it. So it was a good idea, it was a good demonstration of how strategy can work. Um, talking about how sort of that on a sort of broader um, uh, term, whenever we're looking at a film, we'll, we'll talk to the client right at the front end and say, you know, what do you want to achieve? What are, what are your KPIs? What, who are we trying to reach? And then we'll, we'll have a think about whether we, that's actually going to be possible with, with this approach. Um, interesting thing about viral is that vi it depends how you term viral. We've actually produced viral film for internal communication purposes. So if you've got 15,000 people in an organization worldwide and you want to get to as many of those as possible, you send it to a couple of hundred of their colleagues and they forward it all on to their friends and you reach 14,000 people. 14,000 is a great number. Uh, and we've actually seen that work really well with sort of four or five time multiplier on viral effects with internal comms films. And we've also found that if a film gets sent to someone, or this is known, that if a film gets sent to you by a friend, it's, it's in instantly more likely to get watched and it's more credible. That also applies if it's, if it's sent internally rather than being sent from a studio or an HR department. So uh, I'd say if you're engaging on any, on any viral film or an online film you're hoping to go viral, um, make sure you do research. Do your research into the target audience, but also have a look at key and, and come up with a strategy of exactly how you're going to reach that target audience. Um, make sure you approach a company that's got experience. We do see p uh, sort of big ad agencies and stuff trying to produce viral films. And sometimes they'll be successful and they'll get a few million views. But you do have to remember that 85% of uh, video content that goes online with the aim of going viral doesn't go viral. Um, whereas with us, it's more like 85% has gone viral, and it's because you need to make sure that you understand exactly what you're doing. You can't just pr come up with a good idea uh, and hope it goes viral. You need to integrate your key messages. Hopefully you can see from Crash Proof that what we've done is trying to integrate, integrate the message into the film, so even if people didn't read the tagline at the end, they still kind of got what we were trying to tell them, and, and that was proven from the messages that we got online. Um, so I've got I've to move on. I'm not sure to use my seven minutes already. PR is critical. We've run uh, similar films next to each other. Uh, this is all part of the strategy. Make sure you have a, you, you talk about PR right at the front end. We've run uh, Vampire Viral, which has had a few hundred thousand views. Um, we did two posts. One we, we run with PR, and it was featured in it pretty much every national paper is in the metro. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, the one and it had a couple hundred thousand views. The version that had no PR backing has only had sort of twenty or thirty thousand views. So it's very similar to your work from Seabing strategy. Um, don't skimp on budget. Actually, 80% of the films are, that go viral are, have high production values. So the rumor that UGV stuff, stuff that people have created themselves and made to look cheap, is the stuff that's most likely to succeed is wrong. In fact, with, uh, so, uh, with the film you can see there, we designed to make it look like it was shot on a candy can, but it was shot in full HD as it was used in Cinema 2. So make sure you spend the money on the research, coming up with the strategy, and make sure you spend time on the detail and the production, because production that's really, really critical. With Crash Proof, we, put, we, we did it in German because we figured when we were coming up with the strategy that the British bikers would have already heard about this technology if it was British. So let's make it German and people are more likely to, to believe that it's true. User analytics. So we're almost there, Chris. Uh, anyone who hasn't used YouTube analytics, they're fantastic. You can see from Crash Proof a really interesting thing and, and this is how we use this to develop further creatives. Although a minute of it is in German and just a woman talking to camera, people watch it all. They don't tune off. And then you can see at the point of impact, people rewind it and pause it and watch it again to try and find out if it was real or not and figure it out. And we put details in like little glass on the ground and things like that in post-production to, to really add to the effect. So again, it's ad making sure the details there. Um, I think that's me because I'm not allowed to show another film, am I? Oh, that doesn't happen. Um, that's okay. But I've got some other great films that I'm not allowed to show you. But if you go and visit our website, you can have a look at them. And we're going to I'm going to stick around anyway because we've mentioned them last week. Sorry, that feels really quick. No, but hopefully, that, that, that was great. Thank you very much. I mean, for me, some really interesting insights into the relationship between elements of the creativity and elements of the strategy, particularly knowing at that level of detail what sort of messages your audience will and won't respond to, I think is fantastically insightful. But also being able to use viral film um, as, a, as an approach to target a very geographically specific audience 
by going in first of all for widespread views and then using those views to leverage local press coverage, I think is really, really, really significant as, a, as, as an interesting strategy that clearly, clearly works. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to ask to move on straight away to Sarah, if that's okay. I'm just going to stick our slides on um, for you. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Um, I might be getting a bit into semantics here, but I just think generally the word strategy is uh, somewhat overused. Um, and it's worth just actually taking a step back and really thinking about what that means. Um, so for me, strategy is the bit between your setting your objectives and then you're carrying out tasks to achieve those objectives. And strategy for me is actually more about the differentiation, your unique selling point, the vision, the big picture. Um, and I think this is really key because it could mean the difference between your project being successful or fall failing, or it could mean that you know you're doing something reasonably well but maybe not so well. Um, if you, you know, if you're part of a big brand that has a grand strategy, a mission statement, or whatever, then it might be more easy that you know your this tiny online video campaign is part of a much bigger strategy. So I hope I'm not preaching to the converted, but um, I just think it's really important to kind of separate out strategy from the actual tactics of, of doing something. Um, so to make myself clear, and again, I hope I'm not sort of banging this home, but today my strategy is to do something a little bit different. So I don't know if you noticed in my opening slide, but I had a picture of my cat. And I'm hoping that because it's something a little bit different, you might remember me. So the strategy is about being different, the tactic is using cats. Okay, <laughs> it's a bit tenuous, but you know, I'm just trying to uh, illustrate a point. Um, so you're creating content, you're trying to get your content out there. What is the strategy? Um, I think you need to take a, a good step back and really think about who your audience are, what you want them to do, what are they going to watch, um, you know, as Simon's illustrated, they do a lot of focus research, actually taking stuff to people and looking at what people do. There's no point just putting something out there and hoping that people will watch it. Um, so thinking about how your audience behave online, where they hang out, all those kind of things that you learn as part of a general marketing strategy is what you should be thinking about integrating with your video. So if you know the base of where your audience hang out, then put your video there. Um, so I think some key things to think about, the cat again, um, just to take home with you perhaps a few points, your strategy might be about quality and if you're a big brand then you know that's probably part of the course, but a lot of people come to us with really low budgets and very, very high expectations and if you haven't got the budget to do something quality then there's no point in um, expecting some kind of whiz bang HD massive production, it's just not gonna happen. But that might not be part of your strategy. Your strategy could be about frequency, it could be video blogging to get something out there. There's a brilliant um, video blog which is lauded um, in certain circles called winechannel.tv, people might have seen it. Um, but really that's about him, A, being an expert and being very niche, but also about frequent updates to content, so it's always fresh people subscribe to the channel, they keep coming back. Um, authenticity, I think, is really important, especially if it's integrated with social media. There's a billion conferences about social media and so social media strategy, but as we all know, if it's not an authentic voice, if it's just sales pitches, then, you know, it's not that good. So I think that might, that might be something to think about. Um, it could be about dialogue, it could be about building a community. Um, talent is, is another important one because, again, it might come back to budget, but if you can't afford to pay for good talent, if, you, if you're doing webinars and you haven't got a good presenter, 
it's just not you're just not going to get the views you know but we've had a uh, hundred years a hundred years of broadcasting just the reason presenters of bbc breakfast or whatever get paid a lot of money is because they're just natural they can do it if you can't afford the talent then don't use rubbish talent um and i guess being realistic is obvious so think about what you do how am i doing for time <laughs> so um an example i wanted to show uh, i don't know if any of you are art lovers but um we do some work with tate which is around the sort of setting i was involved a little bit in setting up a tate 20 years ago but it's around you know the, the consultancy side side of things and looking at what that content would be that's slightly different to the archive content or just seminars and that, that kind of thing that they run. Um, I think it's worth looking at this as just an, as an example of a strategy which is about quality, about doing something different, developing unique content. So, you know, they're actually taking film crews out on a regular basis now and going to meet artists in their studios, giving you a little insight into their world. Um, I'll show you a bit of video if you don't feel anything so far. This is a great presenter from the Museum of Modern Art in London, a fine artist, um, sponsored by Bloomberg, so obviously one of their tactics is also getting a massive company to give them I think there is a desperation to keep with them. art. They look at art and they, they, they find it very hard to just enjoy it. They have to kind of interpret it. They're and just understand sort of it. well made films and the new, you know, the crew they know don't what they're just doing. Sort of they have um, Ask themselves a Twitter stream which updates people on, you know, oh, we're out, we're filming this today. If you actually look at what they're doing, they're telling people about the content they're making and giving them sneak previews through social media channels, um, all kinds of things going on there. Since this launched in 2007, I think on iTunes alone, they've had beyond 2 million downloads, which for an arts organisation is quite a lot. And obviously, much more views across YouTube and iTunes View and all kinds of different platforms that they use. Um, <coughs> so that's just one example. Um, also, want to talk a bit about BMI. We work with an agency called Prospect in London who make all these very, very high-end films. Again, the strategy is about presenting to people this whole luxurious experience of what it is like to be a business class traveller using BMI flights. And um, have we got this? Can I flip through to these? Um, so it's just reinforcing, again, their sort of luxury brand values. You know, their, their strategy isn't about necessarily huge numbers of millions of viewers, but it's about demonstrating the quality of the service that you get and also being seen. It's full res, it's kind of full screen experience, it's not YouTube, it's a bespoke flash player, probably HTML5 now as well. So it's a bit of a different way of looking at things, but it's, it's more about presenting this kind of aspirational world. Um, I was going to show another example, but I'm not a huge amount of time. I think things to take away is just to really look at you know, what is out there, what is successful, what do you like watching, why? If you look at good things, like I mentioned Wine Channel TV, um, TED, which everybody goes on about, I don't know if you, if you look at that, the reason it's successful is just because the content's really good and they make it really well and they design everything really well. Um, it's all quite simple stuff when you think about it. Um, there's another small channel called Artlaw.tv, which does what it says on the tin, so it's all about... Um, lawyers uh, talking about rights to do with content and cultural content and again it's just well made a nice little interface just using Vimeo but it gets a lot of hits because it does what it says on the tin so um, I hope all that's made sense anyway <laughs> and um, if anybody wants to talk to me about anything obviously then I am here I've got a question for you later on, so I'll come back to it if we have time. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think the no thing problem. that really struck me about this is understanding audiences enough to create community around your content. You mentioned that in one of the list of different um, uh, strategic objectives that you have up when your cat is lying down in the background. Um, you talked about community and about discussion. You know, audiences aren't just out there waiting for you to give them another video. 
there's going to be a reason for them to watch another video. And if your strategy is to try and build and expand on your community, um, then your content flows from what they've already told you about what they like and what they're interested in. And that's a really powerful, and to me, that's a really powerful message. So thank you. Um, Tommy, do you want to come and do it? I feel terribly bad because I feel like we're rushing you all through and we could spend all day talking, um, which I'm sure we could. So um, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, like said, to uh, like said, uh, we are based in Paris. Uh, we are ten people, and mostly we do strategy consulting, and we produce also for brands, and we help them to define strategy, online video strategy. Sorry for my accent. I'm from Belgium. So, technology changing media consumption and viewing uh, behavior. Uh, people have never been so free about watching videos, anytime, anywhere. Uh, an inventory which is totally crazy and infinite. Uh, so uh, it's cool for people, but at the end of the day, it's very difficult for brands to understand how to get uh, catch the eyeballs of these people. And uh, so it, it's complicated. And mostly when we see uh, marketers they come and they say, okay, we want a viral video. And it's very hard to do viral video. So you've got experts who do it. It's not so easy. So make cards uh, and blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's not so, so easy and make money out of it. And you see it, we, we look very deeply into YouTube. And when you watch YouTube, you see that uh, the proportion of video who make more than 10,000 views are just 5%. More than 100,000 views, it's 0.33%. And imagine in this video, it's not all about the brand. It's mostly about the people who do the video cast. So how many brands succeed to make a lot of video? A lot of views, sorry, with one video. Not so much, I think, except with big, uh, good companies who are doing very well. But the, the real, real um, brands who succeed are the ones who become a media and who really leverage this and this power. And mostly they use video. Uh, you've got Burberry in UK, and it's a great example. I don't know if you've been on the website, but if you go there, you will see it's just about video. Even the pro product, it's about video. And these guys understood everything. So they just do the video, the viral stuff around, they understood, and they create an experience with the user. But all the brands are not uh, like Burberry's or McDonald's, which is announcing uh, yesterday, I think, that they are creating a, a television and they, they become a, a media company. Uh, and the ones who succeed, and mostly in YouTube, which we are watching a lot, are talents and media, new media pure player, like in the 2000 years where people were creating media with text. So we, we've developed a really alpha version you can watch. It's really buggy, but no problem. We, we're developing something we call Q-Metrics. What Q-Metrics do, it allows us to create panels, cre uh, take YouTube channels, aggregate these YouTube channels, and get an overview of what's going on. Number of views, number of video pr produced, frequency, and all that stuff. And out of it, we can create as much as panels as we want, music, beauty, whatever, and we, we get key lesson out of it. So first uh, lesson, the ones who win are uh, two kinds, the YouTubers and, uh, as I said, the new media. So about the YouTubers, I don't know if you look at the most channel views on YouTube, it's about these people, Ray William Johnson. Do you know Ray William Johnson here? Nobody knows? Okay, perhaps uh, we are not young enough but uh, every young know these people. Uh, do you know Michel Pham? No. Uh, do you know some, did you see some video about makeup on YouTube? It's a hit, it's a, it's a great success for this industry. It's uh, girls love this. So Ray William Johnson, over 1.3 billion views. Uh, YouTube, Michel Pham, just a category, nearly 500 million views. Look at the number of subscribers. These guys have a community, and that's the key of the things, and they've got talent. So if, sorry. Maybe we'll do like this. Yeah. I just do it like this. What's happening, Forum? Guys, I went to this bar the other night, and there I am, chilling, playing this Pac-Man. And then, holy sh**, a car crashes into the building. Damn! No, that wasn't actually me, but lucky for them, no one was hurt. And I still can't believe the driver actually got the entire car into the building. How in the hell does one man... It's so, th this guy... As we all know, Lady Gaga is making a huge impression in the music industry. She's fresh, 
innovative, and talented. This tutorial will show you how to replicate those silver eyes in her music video. I'm not trying to be Lady Gaga, nor do I think I look like her. I'm just having fun replicating her style. Okay, so it, it's really a phenomenon, and these, these people, uh, the key lesson here, it's more good about engagement and not money. Michelle Pham, she's just a webcam. She's producing really regularly on uh, YouTube. She's got this community of people, and th she just did 167 views. Uh, video, sorry, and she gets 470 million views versus L'Oreal, a big brand, 51 million views, and they had to produce over 3,000 videos. So there is something here. And you see, average view per video uh, for L'Oreal is 15,000, Michel Pham is 2.8. So what can uh, brands can learn out of it? Is that talent is a key, obviously, and community also. So brands do not have so much talent inside them, but uh, they can create the community out of it. And what, how they can get views is make product placement. Go to see these people and try to work with them. It's ramping up very fast in US and it's working so well. You go to see Michelle Pham and if you, get the, 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 if you are lucky with your brand and she puts you will have around 3 million views about your brand in a very community way. And it's the other way you've got the pure players, online media pure players. So these, these, these brands are the goals you were defining uh, about their, their audience, the people, and so on. So Comscore released a, a new study about the, the biggest channels on YouTube. And uh, obviously music is first hit. And after you've got Machinima, Demand Media, and Maker Studio. Demand Media uh, rolling uh, a YouTube channel, which the name is Expert Village. So these three companies have different ways to target people, but they are very good. So Machinima is just about young people and trailer of uh, video games. Expert Village is how to video and Maker Studio. They've got around 200 talents they are leveraging for make pro product placement. And if you watch at the numbers, it's over two, it's over a billion views uh, of these channels. And what is interesting here is that they've got a very strong editorial line. You know, they know who are their customers. They, they, they know the, the goals. And out of it, they create a lot of videos. Uh, and the difference between uh, L'Oreal before who create a lot of videos at the end of the day, it's that they don't have a strong editorial line, uh, even if they know their customers. Uh, and, and they produce a lot. Look at Expert Village, 140,000 video produce. It's just amazing. So they crowdsource the video production, and they are very good at VSEO, optimize, optimize the placement of video into Google Universal, and they get the view out of it. Um, and so at the end of the day, the number of views monthly of some channels are over un are hundreds of millions. So these three companies are really example about what media should do. They should uh, go to see the talent and get an, uh, to, to make product placement and also create their, as a media, uh, volume of videos with a strong editorial line and also engage the community. That's as what we think uh, is a key lesson uh, out of it. So at the end of the day, uh, tribute to Steve, <laughs> uh, you have to think out of the box if you are a media company and you have to get a real, real, real um, uh, strategy like these uh, people do. I was on time. Uh, we have some time for questions. Thanks, Kevin. Um, particularly interesting for me from that talk was about the reality that brands have got to face up to nowadays, which is that they are media companies. If you want a successful consumption of good media that people want to talk about, you have to think like a media company, not just about the creative content or about how to reach and define your audiences, but also how to source talent to put in your content and the power that talent brings you. Not that all good media has to have talent in it, but clearly this is a way of leveraging serious numbers of views and more importantly, serious entry by permission into communities that want to consume content. So that's a really, really, um, strong message to take away from, from, from me. Um, but I'm now more interested in what you guys want to know about after seeing these three people speak. Before we do that, um, can you just join me very quickly in giving our round of applause to all three of our speakers? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for coming and sharing your expertise with us. And um, I hope we're going to continue to exploit this opportunity um, in the form of some questions. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Sean. Yes.
Okay, so how do you, how do you kick start, thank you. So what's your name? Uh, Tom. Tom. Um, thanks, Tom. Uh, how do you kick start a viral distribution campaign between Francis Meeks and Sarah? I am not the best person to ask. That's a very honest response. <laughs> <laughs> Did very well for John Lewis, I think, over the last 35 years. So um, you can pass on that one. I would like to pass That's to fine. Simon, because I think he's much better placed to answer that than me. It's uh, a really good question, and I, I get it every time. Um, uh, I think the first thing is uh, you need a killer creative. You really do. You need a creative that's not just... The amount of times we've had creative sessions and we've said that will make a great TV commercial, but it's not a good viral, because there has to be that something special. Um, if you can do that, and you already have a good network, and you have people of influence you can call upon, it's like um, Speed Dating, one of our other films. Um, we've, we sent it to someone we knew, who's a, a kind of a person of influence online, and they gave us two million views in two weeks because they liked the content. So if you can come up with something that, that's really good, and you, you already know of people that you can send it to, then it's gonna work. Other techniques are things like getting it in the right place at the right time, so making sure it gets exposure quickly. So get it up certain charts, which will get in turn get more people watching it and you get a snowball effect and again as long as the content's good this is the problem with a lot of ad agencies coming up with, with what they think is a great idea they spend a lot of money with seeding so they get 100,000 views but they paid for every one of those views if you've got a really good viral creative that 100,000 views will turn into millions of views that's the difference um, does that answer yeah, that answer really well um, Thomas uh, we, d we, we don't do viral videos but uh, at the end of the day I think when you it's it's about PR at the beginning. It's about influencers, yeah. I think. Yeah, PR, PR was crucial, like I said, with the vampire film. It was PR drove two hundred thousand views, but we knew those two hundred thousand views were all in the UK. Um, and the vampire film, it, there was a fifty percent increase in, in young people going to the dentist after that film was launched. Who are your promoters? The people who who going who are gonna promote your video? Is that the people you have to target at the beginning? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I guess it depends what context you're operating in. I mean, um, a lot of the work we, d we do is in B2B markets, so it might be more about a very small number of viewers, but they're qualified leads where people have registered to watch something and then you can track their activity and you know that they've watched this video for this long, downloaded X. Um, is anybody here more interested in that side of things in terms of B2B, the smaller, B2B video? more niche audiences or anything like that? Is it, is it, would you say, Sarah, it's fair to say, if I made a generalisation, that everybody's audience, target audience is probably more niche and smaller than they think when they start out in this world? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm. I would just point out that even for the video content that we're using in the Rest Cast Our Family, there was an advertising video that was used in the video. So you can see the quality of that video. I'm sure there's a video clip somewhere. I think it, it, you should know yourself where your audience are and how best to reach them and the content that you or you may work with an agency who does I think the content that you create should be obviously very cleverly targeted and it's going to be a combination of lots of things I mean obviously we're talking about online video here but it has to sit with PR uh, whatever not old traditional PR whatever PR is now it has to sit with social media Maybe it still does sit with print, billboards. It just depends, you know, what you want to do. Uh, I mean, I'm going on, <laughs> I do tend to go on a bit, sorry. But, um, you know, somebody said to me the other day that it's kind of like these days, there shouldn't really be a marketing department anymore to an extent. Everybody who, because we're all out there, we all have a profile, we're all marketers, we're all presenting our brand, that's the world we live in. So you know, your, your online video strategy needs to fit across the board with everything that you're putting out about your company. Yeah, uh, can I just say, it's, it's, it's great to use them all together. So if you pay to, to hit a certain number of people, if the idea is good enough, those few people you've paid to get it to will then spread it for you. So it's a great way to get it started. Uh, I'm gonna move you on, so you've got four more minutes. So any more questions from the floor? John. Will people pay for strategy, John's asked. This is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends at what stage you actually come into contact with a client, if they already have a, a very specific brief or an idea that they, they want to execute, then you may have less um, time to actually mm. 
to look at that or to there may be any budget for that element of it. It's a tricky one. If you show them results that are created by having a good strategy, mm. it's hard for them to argue against it. So. Yeah. It depends about their volunteer. If they really want to go into online video, they are keen to pay. If they are just looking at it, if they want to pay for production, and they will see after. But what they want a real, real strategy and they think that online is key for them, they are keen to pay and that's the best customers at the end of the day for us and that's because uh, you can push with them really deep, deep and deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Back. <coughs> So you, you, you have to be very good at distribution. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. And uh, so you've got YouTube, but uh, you've got our video, all these people. So that's uh, the first key point. And uh, you have to create your community around it. N not just about uh, publishing mm -hmm. and putting on YouTube. It's about uh, also your community of people. Mm -hmm. And so you know it's very good because if you've got the interview of uh, key players and all that stuff, Normally, if you've got the community around it, you can leverage it. I mean, it might. To be everywhere? Not a great deal. I think it's more of a business model question. And if you've already got a revenue stream coming in through the licensing fees, then you know you could see it that you could start building that community. You, you've just demonstrated that it's there and it can happen. So maybe you should just start doing it <laughs> at the same time as carrying on with the other model. And then when it gets to the point where they're both even and you can carry on doing the one you want to do without the middleman, then yeah. that might work. Yeah. You can't have your cake and eat it. I got from writing the e-consultancy best practice guide this summer was that um, a lot of, a lot of people out there with the opinion that um, uh, the web is about the proliferation of content, it's about content sharing. It's very, very difficult to create business models that directly monetize content online. Mm -hmm. um, as we've seen from News International who are still you know, finding it really difficult to, and they're, they're a massive news organization with lots of resources. Um, they, the person who gave me this sort of soundbite, their, their main soundbite was to say that in the future, brands are in a better position to create fantastic online content than anybody else because they've got the budget. But that business model is not about the content producer monetizing, it's about the content producer going to the brand rather than the broadcaster to say, hey, I've got this great idea or do you want my sports footage or whatever else. And I just thought that was an interesting sort of soundbite on the state of the market. Not that it's impossible, I think probably sports is closer than any sector to be able to uh, charge premium subscription rates for content consumption. But I think that's, that's part of the reality of the web is people pay for it through their broadband subscription and very, very little else. We've got time for one more question. Uh, sorry to cut you short. I'm sure there's more conversations we've picked up. Question from the back. I thought there were any more <laughs> questions or comments. Were we any good? Are you all happy? <laughs> You're slightly stunned. 
Do you need lunch and coffee? Is that what's going to help? I think you do. Um, in that case, um, will you join me once again in thanking our panellists, Thomas, Simon and Sarah, and have a great day.